Hello, hey guys, my name is uh, Lindsay Barber. I am recording this video for um, my synopsis of my work that I did this semester on uh, food inequality in Philadelphia, um, specifically focusing on food deserts, um, access to healthy and affordable um, foods, and then studying the correlation between that and um, obesity and other health complications like diabetes and stuff and the effects on um, the healthcare system and in turn the government and what kind of that looks like as far as health insurance and welfare and people getting um, the help that they need. And this is a very real, very prominent issue in the United States. Um, Philadelphia is unfortunately a great example of food deserts as we see in North Philly. Um, there is just um, not great access to healthy, affordable foods. And in turn, we see that in high obesity rates. Um, there are you know, a lot of people who are on government assistance, yet um, reports still show that children are going to school hungry. Um, children go to sleep hungry in Philadelphia. It's a very real issue. Um, you know, people being on the streets and stuff, I know how serious this issue is because I work at a homeless shelter here in Westchester, Safe Harbor, and I'm a behavioral technician. And a large um, problem that I deal with every single day is helping people find adequate access um, to resources and how difficult that is. And it really, um, being on the, this end of things, helping people, um, administratively really shows that there is a systemic, systematic um, gap here between the government and the people and why people are going hungry. And yet there appears to be some misallocation of resources. And I don't necessarily go into any of that in my project. That's just a little side note. I want to focus primarily on just um, people's people's lives and the effects of of um, not having food and why this is um, because at the end of the day it's not like there is any shortage of food here you know if anything numerous amounts of food um, from the grocery stores I believe it's 38 percent of grocery um, store items go into the trash and don't even make it off the shelves um, because they go bad and they are not unable to sell them. Um, and so I just think that there's a lot to be done. And I think that if people watch this video and were to take anything away from it, um, it would to be that every single thing that you do, um, matters. One person can help and make a difference. And I'm going to go into a little bit about my ethos and why I personally chose to even get this job at Safe Harbor, let alone do this whole um, research project on it, is be because I was affected myself um, by food insecurity. And I, you know, uh, during the pandemic, lost both my jobs and was hit on really hard times and actually lost my housing as well. But the food, um, not, not having food was really detrimental. I just can't even explain, like, to go to sleep hungry is just not by choice. It is mentally draining, and it just, I, I psychologically still feel um, the effects of that today. Um, my point by bringing that up is that by this one person doing this nice thing has created this whole chain of events. Um, let it, granted, there were multiple people that really went out of their way during um, those years of my life that I was struggling, um, but because they did, um, and and I wasn't able to do anything, you know, I wasn't able to pay any of these people back or anything. Um, they were just kind strangers. Now I get to be that kind stranger. Um, and so on top of my work at the shelter, I do get paid. That is my job. Um, I am volunteering and I bring in food and I love it. I love cooking. I'm a huge cook. 
Um, but since I started this project and talking to people, I realized that I actually kind of enable um, these people will not eat so healthy. I kid you not, I made them fried chicken and all these other, you know, unhealthy food brought in a pie. And 30 minutes later, I'm giving, you know, one of the residents her insulin, which was, you know, routine, but still, I'm just like, I'm really feeding into the, I'm a part of the problem, you know? Um, so I, since starting part of this project, I am going to challenge myself to make them a vegan meal and they I asked they are all on board um, and excited they were like yeah I always bring in my vegan dinners and they always say it looks good but I'm not sure now they get put their money where their mouth is um, and I'm going to work actually I have the, the it's such a privilege I, I work with the nutritionist um, now because of how malnourished I was for all those years, like I said, I, I'm still trying to get that back, but I'm working with my nutritionist to kind of curate um, a menu for my residents, um, a vegan one that's gonna be healthy, and I'm cooking tomorrow night, so I get to go to the grocery store. Here is an example of what uh, you may consider to be a typical grocery store, um, when in fact this is uh, a, a extremely nice grocery store um, that a lot of people don't have access to. Um, and I thought that I'd share some pretty shocking statistics about um, how limited the resources are in the United States and its effects on our health and government. Um, our poor diet is reflected um, that only one in 10 American adults eat enough fruits and vegetables every day, and 70% of U.S. adults are overweight or obese, and about 50% of American adults have one or more diet-related chronic illnesses, such as heart disease. Um, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, responsible for one in four deaths, and type 2 diabetes affects more than 34 million Americans, and another 88 million have prediabetes. Um, rates of obesity-related cancers, including uh, pancreatic or correctal or postmenopausal breast cancer, are on the rise. Um, I don't know, but those are some pretty shocking statistics of including those statistics is to basically shed light on people who are only used to shopping in grocery stores um, that look like the just pictured in the video um, and, and state some pretty shocking statistics um, here in Philly. And like I said, those would be shocking to people um, potentially who are just used to those type of grocery stores and are not exposed to others, or those statistics might seem low to people um, who are only surrounded um, in, by food deserts and food insecurity. So um, it's just important to keep that in mind while shopping. Like It is such a privilege to have access to this food. Um, but eventually, I, I think that it should be something considered more of a right and that everybody, um, you know, should have access to, but also not um, take for granted. So I certainly um, do not take that for granted. I'm um, grateful that I have access to a plethora of options and I was able to get great fresh produce. And now I'm going to just insert some clips of me um, cooking with some more voiceover. All right, so while I'm showing videos of what I'm making here, I'm going to have um, some of the ingredients listed for each and their health benefits while I am um, discussing a little bit further into this food crisis here in Philadelphia. Um, the lack of access to healthy food in Philly is not limited to just one area. Um, although it is more prevalent in areas such as North and West Philly, um, are particularly affected by food insecurity. These areas are often referred to as food deserts, uh, which are defined as an area where people have limited access to affordable and nutritious food due to a lack of grocery stores and supermarkets, as well as the high cost of healthy food in these areas. For many people living in these food deserts, um, their only options for food are fast food restaurants and corner stores, which typically offer unhealthy and highly processed mm -hmm. foods. Um, I'll insert a clip of that later on, and this can lead to a number of health problems um, that I listed earlier. Um, the lack of access to healthy food 
can actually exacerbate existing inequalities already in the city. For example, low-income families and communities of color are disproportionately affected by food insecurity. This is due to a number of social and economic factors, including lack of job opportunities, inadequate public transportation, and systemic and systematic racism. Despite these challenges, there are many organizations and individuals working to address food inequality in Philadelphia, um, such as the Philadelphia Community Gardens and Farmers Markets that have been established by many areas in the city, um, providing fresh produce and healthy food options um, for or, the residents. Or, or, or could do there is much work to be done, but every day um, we are moving closer to a better society. Um, another part of this project that I did, I did take a few videos um, outside of the grocery store. But then I also happened to be down in North Philly um, and I cited a lot of those neighborhoods in my, my research project as being places with high food deserts, report kids, you know, not, not being able to afford school lunches and having high participation in free school lunch programs um, and what their grocery stores look like in, that, in those neighborhoods. And so I was down um, in, in North Philly and I went into the, the local grocery store within walking distance and I, and I looked, there wasn't any other, um, I can maybe screenshot an image here on maps like the other grocery stores that were in the area. So I walked. Basically that gray area in the middle is a food desert, which is highly unusual given it's such a populated area. I walked into this um, bodega and you know even me alone looking for vegan stuff like I was hungry and I was genuinely just looking for something to eat and the options are slim like it's either like a green banana that's like up at the front or um, and whatever that's like a, a very first world problem super you know the fact I have the privilege now um, of you know choice of what I eat I don't just have to eat what I can because it's there and because it's vegan um, but I was just looking around and I took a video of my iPhone that I'll insert here and it's just you'll notice all processed foods um, any healthy foods are extremely limited it's like one brand and it's and it's like well yeah it's like okay we have gas stations and stuff convenience stores that that look like that in certain areas but the thing is we have so many of those they are significantly nicer um, and also grocery stores. And we have so many grocery stores in this area. And um, it's just really, the, it, it's, it's unfair and there's very clear, obvious correlations of why this is this way. And the fact that the issue is still so prevalent and has not been eradicated shows that there is a lot, lot, lot to do. Um, to increase access to healthy foods and to make sure that people are being fed um, and able to, to be lead a productive life and, and you know, be happy. Um, it sucks going to sleep and not knowing where your next meal is coming from or not even going to sleep because your stomach hurts so bad that you're hungry. Um, and just what it does to you, you can't think straight, you can't take care of yourself properly, you feel horrible about how you look and your hair is falling out and it's just no way to live. Um, and if there is something that we can do about it, we should. There is plenty of food in this country, like I said, that gets absolutely wasted in grocery stores. There needs to be programs to get people access to like leftover food that's going to be thrown out um, at a donation. I, again, what that one person did for me is what I do, what I do now at Safe Harbor and why the second that, you know, I was able to get my own apartment again and hold a job and get a car and do all of those things, you know, the point is, is that I didn't have anything. And when I finally had stuff, the very first thing that I wanted to do was to start to give it back because the only way that you get to keep things that you're given is if you give them away. Um, when I got this job at Safe Harbor I, and started cooking, volunteering, I just felt so fulfilled and so like grateful and just like I took pride in what I was doing in my job, like proud to tell people um, 
you know, what I'm doing and get them involved because there's not enough people. Like there are nights where we don't get dinners dropped off. Um, there are, you know, days where like a lot of these women, their needs still aren't being met because they only come back at a certain time and, you know, whatever. These are specific needs to the shelter and stuff. But um, I, I've interviewed Lucretia for this project, a resident at the shelter, and she talks a lot about um, how real the struggle is to get healthy food. And she herself struggles with diabetes and affording insulin and her medication and seeing her doctor and, and dealing with blood sugar and stuff. And the other week, I just had to call the ambulance because of her blood sugar. Um, but anyways, the this whole experience has just been very full circle for me and the fact now that I get to make this video now and educate other people and maybe they see how real the issue is here in Philadelphia and that there is a need there is a very real need um, because I myself was not aware of that before I was in need and now work at the shelter like m m I was completely oblivious that there were people on my very street going to sleep hungry. You know, I was thinking that that happens halfway across the world, which is a gross stereotype and misrepresentation of what's actually going on is that hunger exists everywhere and it runs rampant in the U.S., specifically here in Philadelphia. And there's lots that we can um, do about it. And I'm not saying that each person has this like huge individual responsibility to contribute um, because the realistic kind of reality is that there's only so much every person can do and you know why why should you help if you don't have any kind of personal accountability um, you know many people weren't helped out like I was so why should you help um, and my point is to say like that one person that pulled over in their car and gave me that food, you know, it doesn't have to be much. But, like, that was years ago, and I, like, I'm almost crying right now talking about it because of how much it meant and, and why I do what I do, um, you know, and I'm so grateful for it. And, you know, part of sharing my story is maybe somebody's, you know, can be grateful through me. They don't have to necessarily experience um, that exact situation themselves because, you know, I, you wouldn't wish that on anybody. Um, I hope that you got something out of this.